but the only real authorized theatrical feature film to come from Tolkien's work until Jackson came along is Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. Now, this movie has been examined all over the internet many times over. Decades ago, the Tolkien sarcasm page posted a particularly snarky, nitpicky recap that is harsher on the film than I would be, but it does still make me laugh. And more recently, Dan Olson did a more charitable look at the film, with a more thorough look at the context of the production. So, yeah. Tolkien fans are divided on this movie. Even among the cast and crew of the live-action movies, opinions towards this movie differ. My first introduction to The Lord of the Rings was when I saw the Ralph Bakshi cartoon film in 1978. There is one shot which I regard as my homage to the cartoon, because it did inspire me to want to read the book. Have you talked about the Bakshi version, the Ralph Bakshi version of uh, Lord bit. of the Rings from the 1970s? Yeah, here and there. But it was mostly terrible. Mm. It was mostly really, really, really awful. So, since this movie has been thoroughly examined from seemingly every angle, all I can do is express my personal feelings about this movie. Did I grow up loving it, just grateful to have any adaptation of Fellowship? Or did I grow up hating it and waiting desperately for something better to come along? The answer is... neither. I didn't see this movie as a kid. I really wanted to, but I could never track a copy down for myself. Like, it was available, it was around, it wasn't out of print or anything. But back then, if your local blockbuster didn't have a movie in stock, it was not so easy to get your hands on. I really wanted to see this as a kid. I saw both the Rankin-Bass movies, and I wanted the trilogy to be complete. But the most I saw of this as a kid was the clips used as the opening cutscene of Interplay's Lord of the Rings computer game. I was intrigued to see more, although I was confused as to why the art style looks so different from the other movies in the trilogy. I had no idea. But eventually, long after the Jackson movies came out, my local blockbuster finally obtained a copy of Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. So I finally got to see it, and I've seen it many times since then. And my feelings about this movie? I love that it exists. I don't know if I love watching the movie itself. There are certainly parts I love about it, and I really admire its ambition, but I have a lot of respect for this movie. And I think I love it as an oddity, as a peculiar piece of Tolkien history and animation history. I think for the most part, its heart is in the right place. But I also think a lot about this film is... misguided. The thing that drew Bakshi to Lord of the Rings was the realism it had for a fantasy story. I mean, it was probably the greatest fantasy for realism. Here's a, Tolkien is so brilliant, so great. Um, here's a totally believable world he put together. You know, every page, detail on what they're eating and how they look and how they feel. I've never read anything like it in my whole life to this date. So he wanted to honor that realism by making the most realistic looking animation he could manage. Hence this movie's extensive use of rotoscoping. And you produce photographs from the live action frame by frame. If you put these photographs on an animator's desk and have them draw over the photographs, you now have a pencil drawing of the drawn photograph. And remember how I said that the advantage to doing Lord of the Rings as an animated movie is solving the problem of scale and scale? Unfortunately, the rotoscoped animation sticks a little too close to the live action source footage, so the result is a movie with uncommonly small armies, an uncommonly tall dwarf, and an uncommonly short Balrog. There are other interesting visual stylistic choices, particularly in the backgrounds in some sequences, which I don't think is necessarily a bad choice. It helps convey the fears the characters are feeling, but I think it's odd that Bakshi talked a big game about being so concerned with the realism of the story, and then went and added so many deliberately unrealistic visuals. One minute Middle Earth is being brought to life in beautiful detail, the next minute we're in an endless void of vague color. And sometimes they don't go with rotoscoping so much as solarization, and I don't want to diminish how much work things took back then, but by 1998, a camcorder you got at Costco could do this effect with the push of a button. And no matter how much work you put into it, you can never hide the fact that this is clearly mostly live-action footage in the middle of your animated movie, and the other characters are clearly drawn and just Roger Rabbited in. Or, since this is Bakshi, I guess Cool Worlded in. The effect can be off-putting, but there is one place where I think this effect actually works really well for the story, and that is the Prancing Pony. 
It allows them to include the party atmosphere of the Brie of the book, while still making the hobbits look just as out of place and unwelcome as they feel in the Jackson version. This is the place where I think the stylistic choice works best in service of the story and the tone. The rotoscoping has some interesting results, but ultimately this project is an ambitious filmmaker using experimental techniques for a Tolkien adaptation that doesn't necessarily benefit from those techniques. Fortunately, that would never happen again. For his part, Bakshi later expressed regret at how close the rotoscoping stayed to the source footage. Still, Bakshi was ahead of his time with the use of rotoscoping. Using live-action reference to guide the animation? That's like the biggest thing Jackson's Two Towers was praised for. Unfortunately, this production was also ahead of its time in creating a crunch culture. We were working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. We'd literally leave at eight at night when it was getting dark and say, okay, I'll see you at sunrise. And you'd come back the next day and you'd work and you'd work and you'd drink coffee. And a lot of people drawing, throwing things away. Drawing not good, throwing things away. Hobbit hair. I got, I got fired once for because somebody did a lousy job on Hobbit hair. You know, the production of the Jackson movies was definitely arduous, but the DVD features at least create the impression that everyone was happy to be there, even if times got hard. The DVD for the animated version of Lord of the Rings makes the entire experience of working on the film sound absolutely miserable. And nobody seemed more miserable about it than Bakshi himself. You know, the amount of work to produce rings, the frames, the people, shooting live action and animation. I mean, I don't think anyone ever appreciated I was on the verge of insanity. But there was so much real talent on this film. So much of Bakshi's reputation was built on his movies being adult cartoons, not like Disney cartoons. So it's kind of hilarious that the rotoscope reference for Frodo was an original Mouseketeer, and the rotoscope reference for Sam and Bilbo would go on to be the original Figment. As for the voice cast, it's all great British theater actors. The most famous is John Hurt as Aragorn. Here is the sword of Elendil of Gondor, who fought the Dark Lord long ago and was slain. The most surprising is Anthony Daniels in a rare non-3PO role as Legolas. What a people you dwarves are for hiding things. On the gates of your most wondrous ancient kingdom, you write, speak, friend, and enter. And no spell in any language can open the door. And on a sad note, Elrond is played by Andre Morel, who passed away just a few weeks after this was released. Is animated Elrond just a cursed role? As an adaptation, it's mostly a straightforward adaptation. Obviously, things get shuffled around and condensed, as they do in all adaptations. Very few things are created out of whole cloth for this one, but as is usually the case in Tolkien adaptations, characters get conflated. <laughs> Legolas! Okay... Glorfindel? Ugh. Everything all right? Oh, he's been pissed about this longer than the rest of us. He's still mad about the cartoon. Look, I'm not upset about getting replaced by Arwen in the movies. I get it! She's great! <laughs> she's the freaking even star, and she's the big romantic lead, so let's increase her role, fine. <laughs> Arwen's great. Yeah, yeah, everyone loves our little sister. No oh, hush. But the stupid cartoon replaces me with Legolas, a freaking wood elf. Do you think that all elven subcultures are just interchangeable, Bakshi? You can't just go and replace a Nolda with a Sindar willy-nilly. The only reason he was in Rivendale was to apologize because he lost Gollum. But sure, give him my role. I died in the First Age and was resurrected. But sure, let the Trust Fund kid from Mirkwood take over. God, just give all my glory to the guy who already happens to be in the story. Hey, at least you weren't replaced by the same guy twice. I will find Aomer and his riders. At one point, Bakshi wanted to do a full trilogy, but he couldn't figure out how to make the second film work. Little did he know that the way to make the second film work is apparently just to completely screw up Faramir and Treebeard. For a while, there was also interest in Bakshi doing The Hobbit as well, which may have been stopped directly because of the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, leading Bakshi to publicly mock Rankin-Bass Productions, claiming that his Tolkien movie is not going to have any song for the sake of a record album. But, like... You know there are songs in Lord of the Rings, right? It's not just to sell soundtracks, it's actually part of the book. You do know this because you did include one of the songs in your movie. 
even if you didn't include it on the soundtrack album. There is an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old grey hill. Ultimately, it was decided that there would be two films, and then there was only one. This is not the fault of the adapters, but it does kind of make the film suffer as setups are introduced without payoff, leaving it impossible to really judge their effectiveness as setups. Many people have talked about how annoying this take on Samwise is, and I really wish we could have seen him actually come into his own at the end of the story to see if this particularly squealy Sam was an effective setup for his arc. Alas, we'll never know. Also, there are plenty of things to nitpick about the adaptation, like the fact that as much as Bakshi bragged about staying true to the book, he'd occasionally subvert a detail. Nothing that, like, fundamentally changed the functions of the story, like some of the Rankin-Bass changes, just little things like how the text deliberately notes that the doors of Durin swing outward. <laughs> That is such a small nitpick, it is not important to the story or anything, it's just another of those things where I can't imagine why it was change. Especially since the change makes the watcher in the water shutting them in look a little clunkier than it would if he was slamming the door in on them from the outside. More prominently, there are some... interesting pronunciations in this. I'm not really in a position to judge because I'm sure I've been saying so many character names wrong, but then again, I'm just one dork and not a guy with a production team who can take the time to memorize the pronunciation guys in the appendices. One odd pronunciation choice is pretty infamous, the fact that it was decided to change Saruman's name to Aramon to make it less confusing with Sauron, but that decision is only used in half of the final film. I have come for your aid, Saruman the White. That would take the ring too close to Isengard and Aruman. And there are other odd or just plain incorrect pronunciations that pop up here and there. And this is my Lord Celeborn. You come with me to Adoras, my friends? If Saruman strikes now, he will overrun Adoras in a single night. I know the language of Middle-earth is important because, well, the languages are the reason there is a Middle-earth, but in the grand scheme of storytelling, the pronunciations are nitpicks. The biggest problem with this movie is it's incomplete. And we'll never know if the completion would have been satisfying because part two never happened. There's a lot of hearsay about why part two never happened, but one of the rumors is that Bakshi walked away specifically because he was mad that they dropped part one from the title and tricked audiences into seeing an incomplete film. The studios were concerned nobody would pay money to see a part one because they'd think it's just half a movie. This was a simpler time in Hollywood. If that is the reason Bakshi walked away, it might be counterintuitive that your revenge for the studio tricking your audience into not knowing the film was incomplete is to never complete the film. I don't know. I don't think the problems with this film, either on screen or behind the scenes, can be blamed on any one person. I don't think this is fully a case of Bakshi ruining the text, nor do I think it's fully a case of those meddling studio heads ruining his vision that would have been perfect if they just gave him free range. I think Bakshi genuinely wanted to do right by Tolkien, and I think he did in a lot of aspects and then misplaced ambitions sometimes got in the way. I think all of the cast and crew tried their hardest to make the best Lord of the Rings film they could within their limitations, and a confused studio made those limitations even harder than they needed to be. I think ultimately, this just turned out to be a more difficult task than expected. But if nothing else, this movie proved that Lord of the Rings wasn't entirely unfilmable, as it had so long been believed. So I will always be grateful to it for that, if nothing else. Without this, we wouldn't have the Jackson trilogy, we wouldn't have any of Lord of the Rings' current resurgence in pop culture. This movie saved Lord of the Rings, you could say, or at the very least, made it possible for it to become mainstream. Bakshi is retired from animation, and he has often said that even if he goes back into it, he's done with adapting other people's work. But as recently as 2018, he said that if the studio wants to conclude his version of Lord of the Rings, he'd be happy to consult. And you know what? I say go for it. Just do it, Warner Brothers. If you can have 18 concurrent unrelated Batman movie franchises, you can have three versions of Return of the King. Hashtag release the backsheet cut. Mm -hmm.